This is a Land Rover Defender hardtop, the high-end commercial vehicle for a very successful farmer. Now the rooftop tent here is just to grab your attention. Let's see what this hardtop business is all about. The Land Rover Defender hardtop doesn't have rear seats, instead it comes with some cargo space. It can be had in a short wheelbase version called the 90 or in a long wheelbase version called the 110, like this one. In my pickup truck reviews I have often repeated that in Europe this body type isn't particularly appealing because the open bed attracts casual thieves and since we don't have the second amendment allowing us to shoot anything that steals we prefer vans which protect our cargo from the eyes of nefarious types. However the problem with vans is that even with all-wheel drive they are not designed to go off-road and this is where the Land Rover Defender hardtop comes in. By the way I really appreciate this test unit comes on wide steelies now, you can't have those with the more powerful engine variants due to tires and brakes, but if I were configuring a Defender for myself, I'd always take the car on steelies. They just do it for me. I don't think anyone doubts the Defender's off-road capabilities. In the hands of an experienced driver, it can handle obstacles at the side of which most SUVs lose the rugged-looking plastic trim. That's not to say that Defender can't get stuck, which is why I said experienced driver. And here's a suggestion to all fresh buyers, sign up for an off-road driving course and learn how to use your new car. It's very cool that in automatic mode the Defender will go further than any other SUV, but then you have to hike a long way back to get a tractor to pull you out. Remember to turn on the right mode, engage low range, increase the ground clearance from 218 to 290 mm with the optional air suspension. The ground clearance with standard suspension is 226 mm. This time, instead of driving off-road, I decided to test the operation of an aftermarket winch, which would have come in handy a few years ago when I got the first test defender in Poland stuck on the banks of a lake. Sometimes all it takes is a foot or two and the car can continue on its own power. For summer, I put all-terrain tires on my Countryman and, as you can see, they do very well propelling the car up the sandy hill. At the top, however, it lacked ground clearance or speed. With more ground clearance or speed, I would be able to drive over a pit where most off-roaders driving up the hill start digging holes. With a winch, we got the Countryman out in a matter of minutes. And I know there's a winch cover for everyday driving, but I removed it for the video. Also, I know in challenging terrain you can remove more trim from the front so that you have better access to clean the winch afterwards. Now back to the cargo area, which, at the same time, is bigger and smaller than you think. It's over 142 centimeters wide in places, but we're mainly interested in 116 centimeters between the wheel arches. The length is up to 147 centimeters to the bulkhead, height is just under 94 centimeters. Capacity of 1719 liters dry or 2059 liters wet, which doesn't happen in real life. Cargo capacity up to 780 kilograms with air suspension or up to 760 kilograms with standard suspension. As you can see in the cutaways, it is possible to put a Euro pallet with goods inside. On the first attempt, the package was just a couple of centimeters too high. While it contained soft goods, I didn't want to risk damaging the interior, so we removed one row from the pallet. These individual packets could later be added on the sides or behind the pallet. I'm sure the owner of such a car would learn how to pack the goods in a way they fit. Unfortunately, a Euro pallet won't fit in a 90 hardtop. The cargo area is about 20 centimeters too short, and because there is a door opening to the side, you can't leave it open like you would with a pickup truck tailgate. Also, the door cannot be easily removed like in a Jeep Wrangler, which can be taken apart with a wrench and a screwdriver, as long as the screws don't break because the original Jeep screws seem to be made of clay. 
access to the cargo area and the 110 hardtop is also possible through the side door. There is a 155 liter underfloor storage compartment going all the way across and it can be loaded either from the top or from the sides. For example, if you have a ladder for the rooftop tent, but shorter than the one for the JLR branded tent. Somebody didn't think that one through, I think. Alternatively, you can hang the ladder on the bulkhead, but above what would normally be the door armrest because only then it'll fit. There are also pegs to hang things like work clothes. On the rear door side is another underfloor storage compartment with 58 liters capacity. And an optional air compressor. It comes in handy when you need to air down for off-road driving and once you're back on tarmac, you don't have to look for the nearest service station. Yes, you can have a portable air compressor, but isn't it nice to have a built-in one? What else can you do with this cargo space? Well, sleeping here will be challenging, maybe on the diagonal, and that's if you're like up to 180 centimeters tall, unless you like sleeping all curled up. Or just install one of those tool or camping boxes back here, because you'll be sleeping in a tent anyway. Briefly about the rooftop tent. I haven't slept in it because it was filthy. Also, I'm sure there are better tents than this one. When folding it, there are always bits sticking out from the sides and you have to push them in, hoping not to get your fingers stuck in the clamshell. If you're 175 centimeters tall like me, you're leaning against a probably dirty car. And if you're shorter, I recommend using one of those step ladders, which I imagine Napoleon would love. Besides, I noticed that if you don't make sure that the canvas is properly arranged in the unfolded tent, you risk flooding the interior with rainwater or condensation, and there doesn't seem to be any drainage. For some reason, there is no anti-condensation mat, so moisture also accumulates under the mattress. I won't even mention the latch. There must be better options out there, even if they don't bear the Land Rover logo. By the way, dynamic roof load for the Defender is 100 or 168 kilograms. That's with the off-road tires and I guess it has something to do with lower top speed. Static load is 300 kilograms. The cabin looks very similar to that in the non-commercial Defender. This test unit gets optional leather trim on the gear lever and the steering wheel. It's a small thing, but it lifts the experience in the driver's line of sight and touch. From behind the wheel, I don't get the impression that I'm driving a commercial vehicle. Although the seats look tacky, they're very comfortable. However, the lever for adjusting the height of the seat not only looks cheap, but also is. Probably one of the previous reviewers was looking for the backrest tilt adjustment lever and almost broke what's the height adjustment lever. The backrest tilt is electrically operated. There is no high console in the middle, but there are cup holders on the floor as well as two large cubbies. You can also stow stuff behind the seats. This is the two-seater version, but if I were configuring a workhorse like this, I'd probably add an additional jump seat in the middle. Folded down, it serves as an armrest with cup holders. Open, it is suitable for occasional use. Now, the infotainment system is the same like in every other Defender. I appreciate the 360 camera system with on-road, off-road and towing modes. Android Auto still works sometimes. Sometimes it's wireless, sometimes it's wired, and sometimes it doesn't work at all. Under the display is the same set of buttons and knobs to control the air conditioning and four-wheel drive. Everything is clear and easy to read. The door pockets are mid-size and so is the glove box. Above it is a shelf with an extra USB port. This is the third Defender I'm driving and they all ride and handle similarly. If you like big cars with uh, moderately direct steering, you'll feel right at home. The Defender almost wafts. Imagine a pickup Rolls Royce with a diesel. Despite the rear cargo area, there is some rearward visibility through the grille and the bulkhead. Of course, you can't see much as uh, 
a third of the window is covered by the spare wheel, you can always order a virtual mirror. It certainly comes in handy when you're loaded up to the roof. However, I'm not a fan of those virtual mirrors because I have a problem with uh, eye accommodation. I prefer using the wing mirrors and I also have the 360 camera for maneuvering in tight spaces. The only problem with visibility, like a real problem, is at intersections when you're turning right, you can't see anything from the B-pillar onwards. So watch those bike paths before you get to the turn. Performance, if you expect any, this is the D250, which is a 3-liter inline-six diesel with a mild hybrid. Power, as the name suggests, is 250 horsepower, and torque is 570 newton meters. The Defender can tow up to 3.5 tons. 0 to 100 km per hour should take 8.4 seconds. In sport mode, I was a few tenths short, but this car is equipped with a roof tent and all-terrain tires, so that affects acceleration. And the same goes for fuel economy. Land Rover claims this car should use about 9 liters per 100 km combined. I'm averaging above 10 liters. Again, the tent and all-terrain tires. My countryman on all-terrain tires and with a roof rack also uses 10 to 15% more fuel than it should. Soundproofing is very good for such a brick of a car. Up to about 110, 120 km per hour, the cabin is relatively quiet. Above that speed, the wind noise becomes noticeable. This rig only gets regular cruise control and something that fails at keeping you in your lane, but you can turn it off permanently. Prices of the Land Rover Defender 110 hardtop start at around 75,000 euro, including VAT. The new VW Amarok starts at around 47,000 and it's a five-seater. A single cab Toyota Hilux 4x4 starts at around 40,000 euro. This test Defender 110 hardtop costs around 80,000 euro. But as Land Rover points out, the Defender hardtop has virtually no competition. Is there a need for such a vehicle, though? Well, in very specialized applications, certainly. Alternatively, for very rich farmers, because for the price of the Defender, you can buy a pickup truck and an SUV. And what do you think about the Defender commercial van? Drop me a comment below this video. If you like my sarcastic, down-to-earth and possibly mildly amusing car reviews, join me every Friday at 3 p.m. Central European time. And don't forget to subscribe and like this video as it helps me with the YouTube algorithm. Thanks for watching, and I will see you in the next one.